Good morning. This will be the final lecture, unfortunately. Unfortunately, therefore, that I have very much enjoyed lecturing here in Helmholtz Institute. I will speak the chapters in the part 8 of the book, Measurement of the Intrinsic Electric Properties of Biological Tissues. Here are two main chapters, impedance cardiography and uh, impedance tomography, and then some small chapters discussing some other issues. Last time I started with impedance cardiography, but I will start again from the beginning to make it just uh, an entity. And, and uh, I will skip some, some slides here, but I, I start from the beginning in impedance cardiography. Bioelectric basis of impedance platysmography. <coughs> the word platysmography means uh, measurement of uh, volume changes. The basic equation for impedance measurement was uh, derived by David Gezelowicz, the same colleague who derived the equation for uh, the bioelectric field and for the biomagnetic field. So he has derived these three main equations in bioelectromagnetism. We have a volume conductor which has a conductivity sigma and the conductivity is function of uh, location and time. Impedance is measured with a, a pair of electrodes. To one pair of electrodes it is fed an electric current and with other pair of electrodes it is measured the voltage. So this current flow lines with shown with green lines, they are physically physical current flow lines due to this uh, current which is fed to these electrodes. These blue lines indicate the lead field of this voltage measurement lead which is obtained in the way that it is first fed a reciprocal current here and found how the current distributes in the volume conductor and that is the lead field. Then of course current is not fed anymore, it is only measured the voltage with this lead. The equation derived by Gezelowicz describing the impedance describes how the macroscopic resistivity Z which is the impedance per unit volume, is derived from the spatial distribution of conductivity sigma, weighted by the dot product of the lead fields of the voltage and current electrodes. This is the basic equation. Because here is a dot product of two uh, lead fields or two fields, it means that in this region where these two lead fields are parallel, the measurement sensitivity for the impedance is positive. In those regions where these two lead fields are more or less normal to each other, the measurement sensitivity is uh, more or less zero. And in those regions where they are opposite in direction, the measurement sensitivity is negative. This sounds quite strange, this issue of negative sensitivity. In 1998, in my group, Pasi Kauppinen made a publication calculating with a computer model, I come again to this, this slide later, Com calculating with a computer model the uh, sensitivity distributions of impedance cardiography measurement systems with different lead systems and found clearly that here are regions of negative sensitivity. <coughs> that was very confusing. I didn't understand first what means negative sensitivity in this sense. Uh, I thought that in, in measurement of electric uh, fields and measurement of magnetic fields, uh, the sensitivity is clear issue, but in uh, measurement of impedance, there is something very strange when there is a negative sensitivity. 
But as I briefly told you last week, two weeks ago I suddenly found that this is clear, this issue now. So it has taken uh, 16 years for me to think about this. Well, I didn't think all the time that, but anyhow, it has been in my mind for a long time. And uh, I show you some slides which indicates that I'm continuously improving and developing this uh, course on bioelectromagnetism, uh, uh, introducing new material here. And here is the story. The concept of negative sensitivity can be explained in this way. If you think first uh, measurement of bioelectric field from the bioelectric source, the signal from an impressed current source is proportional to the dot product of the lead field or the measurement lead and the source field. That's what I say. Here is the equation 1130, which I gave you a long time ago. J sub L E, V sub L E is a measured signal. J sub L E is the lead field or the lead. And the source field is impressed current density field multiplied by one over sigma. And this field is function of location of time. This is just what you have learned two months ago, you find from the book. Now I go to the impedance measurement. I say that the signal from an impedance measurement is proportional to the dot product of the lead field or the measurement lead and the source field. This is the equation from the previous slide, the David Geselowitz equation, and you find that the impedance signal it is lead field or the voltage measurement lead dot source field which is 1 over sigma times the current field. 1 over sigma J sub L E times e, uh, which is uh, a function. This is not uh, dot multiplication. It is function of location and time. And now when you compare these two cases measurement of impressed current source and measurement impedance, you recognize that the equations are identical. The equations are identical. Identical with the only exception that here in impressed current source measurement, it is the impressed current source field and impedance measurement, it is the current field, but otherwise exactly identical. I'm very happy. You don't believe how happy I am when I found this connection at least so long a time when until someone says that I'm wrong. Uh, I'm very happy because this joins together the impedance measurement tightly to this structure of bioelectromagnetism, which I like to uh, introduce you. Let's take an example. Here I have the same sentence as in the previous slide. I repeat that the signal from an impressed current source is proportional to the dot product of the lead field of the measurement lead and the source field. Let's take an example from the uh, activation of the ventricles, apical depolarization at 230 milliseconds after the initiation of, of uh, uh, the activation in sinus node. At that instant of time, the depolarization wave front is in left and right ventricle. These black arrows represent the bioelectric uh, activity, the impressed current uh, source field, the, the impressed current elementar uh, uh, sources, they f form this. Uh, this double, uh, this uh, double layer here, or this uh, uh, source. Here is uh, conductivity sigma shown for the uh, media. And the lead field in this case is now uh, the X lead. Source field is one over sigma Ji. 
and the equation for measuring the bioelectric field or signal is here. J sub L E dot J I multiplied with one over sigma, which is the source field. Old story, nothing new here. But the uh, until now, but now the new issue is <coughs> that you recognize that these regions contribute with a positive signal to the measurement lead because these uh, impressed current source elements are oriented parallel, well I should show you in this way, <laughs> parallel with the lead field and in those regions when they are in opposite direction, more or less opposite direction, the contribution to the signal is negative. Well this is at this instant of time after a while this, uh, this activation has taken a different form when the, the depolarization proceeds in the cardiac muscle, but at this instant of time it looks like this. So what I point, want to point out is that the issue of positive and negative sensitivity exists equally also in the measurement of bioelectric field due to the impressed current uh, source uh, density and of course similarly in measuring the biomagnetic field. I don't have that slide but it is just exactly the same. So the issue of negative sensitivity, negative contribution from a positive source is nothing new in, uh, in, in and it's not only in impedance measurements, it exists equally, similarly also in measurement of bioelectric fields. That is my point. And here just showing again the impedance source, we have the volume conductor, uh, current uh, feeding electrodes, voltage measurement lead and that region gives a positive contribution and that re those regions give negative contributions. The lead field is J sub L E, just this uh, lead field of the voltage electrodes and the source field is 1 over sigma times the lead field of current feeding electrodes. This is the point. Uh, last time I just briefly did show this coal, coal plot, I skip this and I go to impedance cardiography. So the first main clinical application of impedance measurements was the impedance cardiography. Uh, instrumentation which was developed in Minneapolis, uh, USA by group Kinnan, Kubitschek and Patterson. It was developed for the uh, United States uh, space project. And it uh, looks very simple, uh, having uh, two pairs of electrodes and uh, critical point is this xiphid sternal joint. Uh, current electrodes are placed, the bands on the neck and lower thorax and voltage measurement electrodes on the neck and just on the level of this xiphisternal joint, the joint between xiphoid and sternum. And because you know the uh, principle of reciprocity, you easily understand that we can swap the current and voltage electrodes, we can feed the current to the inner pair of electrodes, measure voltage from the outer pair of electrodes without any change in the measurement result. <coughs> Signals what, is, what are obtained with this impedance uh, cardiography system are first, it is measured just normal ECG, the AVF lead, just normal ECG, no, not, nothing uh, uh, different. It is also measured the phonocardiogram with the microphone and now come the real impedance signals. This is the impedance measured with this uh, device with the uh, two pairs of electrodes. And for, uh, for historical reasons or for, uh, I would say that for, uh, for uh, uh, therefore that it would indicate the 
amount of blood in their lungs, that could uh, a logical reason, this impedance signal is shown upside down. So when impedance increases, this signal goes down. When impedance decreases, it goes up. So this is how the impedance of the thorax changes during the cardiac cycle. Here is calibration signal, which is fed to the uh, system. The signal which is used in impedance cardiography is the first time derivative of this impedance signal. It's taking the time derivative. Of course, the taking the time derivative does not increase the information. All the information does exist already in the impedance signal, but it is easier to find out the Im information from the time derivative signal. There has been several studies, <coughs> excuse me, several studies uh, to, uh, uh, to identify what these deflections in the impedance signal do represent. And here is a study by Lababidi and colleagues. They found that the uh, uh, deflection A uh, takes, uh, happens at the same time with atrial contraction, B with the closure of tricuspid valve, X at the closure of aortic valve, Y at the closure of pulmonic valve, O at the opening snap of mitral valve, and uh, Z at the third heart sound. So these are very carefully studied and, and, and they just uh, occur at those instances of physical, physiological uh, happenings. Here you find from this signal also that uh, when this is a calibration signal, its first time derivative is shown here and it gives the calibration. Uh, important uh, measure here is uh, DC over DT minimum, which means that it is the maximum deflection of this first time derivative signal from the baseline. Why there is the minimum said, therefore, that it is upside down. There has been studies about the origin of the impedance signal, where the signal comes from. Here is the results from one study of Penny, uh, quite old story, but anyhow, uh, he found that uh, to the signal, uh, the organs did contribute in the following way. Pulmonary arteries and lungs, about plus 60%. Aorta and thoracic muscles, about plus 60%. Pulmonary vein and left atrium, plus 20%. Vena cava and right atrium about plus 20%. And then you find something confusing. When you just sum up this, you find that uh, it is 160%. What's wrong? Wrong is that left ventricle has a contribution of minus 30% and right ventricle minus 30, and that means 100, 100%. Why left ventricle and right ventricle have negative contribution? It's easy to understand. I haven't seen any explanation, but my explanation for this is that because the critical band electrode is here just on the level between atria and ventricles, the measurement sensitivity is negative in the, the region of ventricles. Uh, how that uh, equation for uh, uh, calculating the stroke volume is derived, I just skip the the theory, it is not so, uh, the, the, I, I show an example. It is made a model, a cylindrical model, which has the blood volume and, and the rest of the tissues of the thorax. But uh, it's very strange, anyhow, how the equation can be explained. This is the equation for the stroke volume. Stroke volume means the amount of blood which is pumped with one, uh, one uh, cycle in the heart. Uh, it is rho sub b, which is blood resistivity, times L square, which is the distance, uh, just measured distance between the inner electrodes, over z square, which is the average impedance, which is given by the instrument just on the display. And then dz over dt minimum is its absolute value, 
which is the maximum deflection of the, of the first time derivative curve, times ejection time. This is the equation for calculating the stroke volume. How do we understand this equation? It is very strange. Think that here is the ejection time which can be easily found from the first time derivative impedance signal. Blood flows during the ejection in the beginning to the lungs and aorta and at the latter part of the ejection time, though it is still blood is flowing to lungs and aorta, there is also blood returning from the lungs to the left atrium. Therefore, during the ejection time, the uh, impedance uh, don't, all the ejection time uh, decrease, but it uh, it starts to increase. So this is the measured delta Z, the change in the impedance during the ejection time, but it is assumed that how much would the impedance change if it would change the whole time of the ejection time with its maximum rate of change. This is the delta Z, which is dc over dt min times ejection time. So that is a very strange assumption. Uh, it may be thought that it is somehow uh, correct in the way that it calculates or ex estimates how much the impedance would change if there would be not a return of the uh, blood from the uh, lung to the left atrium. But th that's... Uh, that's uh, I don't like it, let's say so. I don't like it. That's, that's very strange. But that's anyhow what this equation uh, expresses. Uh, there has been, uh, by Kinnan and Kubitschek, very primitive models to, to study the, 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 uh, what the impedance uh, system measures. And Sakamoto made a, a bit more detailed uh, analysis the, I think uh, maybe there's some better analysis in the world, but the best, at least at its time, was this made by Kaupinen in his uh, part of his PhD thesis in Tampere. Uh, he studied uh, with the Visible Human uh, Man project uh, uh, data uh, with, with, with a thorax model or, or body model which was made from that data, studied what are the sensitivity distributions of impedance cardiography with different measurement uh, configurations. This is the original uh, four-band electrode system by Kubitschek and colleagues. Penny and colleagues developed a four-spot electrode. These are just normal ECG electrodes, four-spot electrode model. Bernstein used eight spot electrodes and Voltier and colleagues used nine spot electrodes. And I show now again the sensitivity distribution of this, uh, uh, this, uh, these lead systems, and that is what I did show you first. So you find that uh, most of the positive sensitivity does exist there. There is most blood, which is in the aorta and the big, uh, big arteries and veins in these regions. And you find that there is negative sensitivity regions just for the reason which I described earlier. This is the Minnesota Impedance Cardiograph. This is the basic instrument here on the left. The, data, the number here is the basic impedance Z, the average impedance. And it is possible to buy also this uh, uh, device which uh, makes recording and uh, shows on oscilloscope. Well, this is old stuff. I don't think they are any more uh, available, uh, that a lot of development has taken place in this issue. Here is another impedance cardiograph by Bowman Medical Manufacturing. And here is another one, which is a BioZ impedance cardiography uh, monitor. I show some slides on this. The uh, BioZ just uh, ha has sales promotion by saying that the historical method for uh, hemodynamic monitoring is the invasive method, uh, the so-called Schwann-Ganz catheter, 
which is used for, for cardiac output measurements just uh, invasively. And they claim that this device, which has these uh, four electrodes, has uh, current transmitted and it seeks path of least resistance, which is the blood field aorta. So they claim that uh, the impedance measurement takes place along this very narrow path, just along the aorta. And corresponding change in impedance is measured. And if you return back to the picture which I did show you, uh, here is a uh, measurement sensitivity distribution of this four electrode system. You find that it is a bit sales promotion to claim that it goes only this narrow path. This is the sensitivity distribution in reality. And it is from the BioZ monitor also and some sales promotion uh, pictures. They claim that uh, cumulatively in 2004, which is 10 years ago, over 3 million patients were monitored with this instrument and by over 7,000 physicians. So it is very popular in, in, in practice. How accurate this impedance cardiography method is in, in measuring the, the, the stroke volume and cardiac output? There are a lot of studies uh, and uh, I also made one study when I was in, in the uh, cardiological laboratory in Helsinki University Central Hospital. Uh, what is the golden standard to which measurement it should be compared? The golden standard for uh, cardiac output measurement is very old. It is still the golden standard. It is so-called FIC principle, uh, developed by Adolf Fick in uh, late 1800. The idea is that it is uh, uh, measured how much oxygen the patient is uh, using when uh, uh, through his breathing, and it is measured uh, the oxygen content in the atrial and in the mixed venous uh, blood. And with this equation, very simple equation, it is obtained the cardiac output in liters per minute. It's very accurate, very accurate uh, measurement. The only problem is that it does not give beat to beat measurement. It gives an average from the longer period of time for which it is used, a few minutes time. Uh, I made a study. I just want to show what kind of work I made in 1975, which is quite a long time ago. I compared the uh, <coughs> thick cardiac output and impedance cardiac output and got this kind of correlation, which I consider is excellent correlation when thinking that the impedance cardiography instrument is indirect measurement system. It is not direct, it is indirect measurement system. I feel that this is an excellent, excellent correlation. So it looks very good. Uh, the modern way invasive way to measure the cardiac output is uh, the equation is similar as in the FIC principle but the measurement is made so that it is uh, fed uh, indicator substance uh, a kind of dye a color color substance to the to the blood circulation and it is measured its content uh, and and it shows this kind of curve how because first it uh, raises when the dye comes to this lo measurement location, rises high, and of course then at the time it uh, decreases when the dye passes the, the, uh, the uh, uh, circulatory system, and then there comes a recirculation when the blood comes again, but it may be estimated how it would uh, dilute out if there were no recirculation. This is rather uh, accurate method. <coughs> and then there is another method which is uh, thermodilution. It is just uh, fed a bolus of uh, cold saline and it is measured the, the temperature of the blood with a, with a uh, thermistor which is at the tip of the catheter. Uh, here is a study made by Lababidi about impedance cardiography, cardiac output and dye dilution. Uh, sorry. Excellent, excellent correlation, I would say. Very good. 
The same colleague, Laba Bidi, uh, he was a pediatric. He had uh, children as his patients. He made a study with 21 children who had left to right shunt in the heart. It means that there is uh, the opening which is in between the ventricles, which is in the s uh, upper part of the super region of the septum, is left open. With the fetus, this is uh, open. There is an uh, uh, open window, as we would say, through which blood is flowing direct, directly from left ventricle to uh, right ventricle. And it closes at the birth. It's, it's exciting to think that such happens when the baby is born. Uh, but in some cases, that hole doesn't close fully and there is a so-called left to right shunt in the heart, which means that there is, due to this abnormal flow of blood, there is more flow of blood in the lungs, through the lungs, than in the systemic circulation. In normal case, it is, as we know, it is exactly the same amount of blood is going through the lungs and thereafter to the systemic circulation, because they are in series. In such patients, he compared the systemic flow, FIC, cardiac output, and impedance cardiac output, and found that the impedance cardiac output readings or results were much higher. This is logical, because we believe that the signal originates from the lungs, and uh, because in the lungs there are flowing more blood than in the systemic circulation, it is clear that we get with the impedance cardiac output higher readings because it is uh, measuring the lung circulation. Very logical. Then, uh, Lava Bidi made FIC uh, cardiac output measurement from the pulmonic flow. It was in the systemic flow in a previous slide. He made from the pulmonic flow with the same patients. And now the impedance cardiac output and FIC correlated excellent way, which indicates that, yes, the signal comes from the lungs. Then Lababidi had 13 patients, children, who had aortic insufficiency, which means that the aortic valve is leaking. So there is uh, blood pumped from the left ventricle to the aorta, and part of that is leaking back to the left ventricle, which means that in the aorta there is flowing more blood than in the uh, whole other, in, in the total uh, systemic circulation. And what happens now? Again, he got impedance cardiography with the impedance cardiography, larger signals, which indicates that, yes, the signal is coming from the aorta. So this is very confusing. That shows these two studies indicate that if the heart is normal, with no leaking valves, no shunts, and so on, if it is normal, then impedance cardiography gives surprisingly good results. But if there are some problems in the, in the blood flow, it gives uh, misleading readings. That is my conclusion. Anyhow, it is an excellent instrument because it is non-invasive, cheap instrument. And as I said, it gives reliable uh, stroke volume measurements in normal hearts. And it gives a lot of other information. I show here an example. I made an exercise test when I was in the hospital in 1974. I made an exercise test and measured several uh, uh, parameters with the impedance cardiography. Uh, I was myself, I was the subject. That was the time when I was young and strong. As you know now, I'm, I'm only strong. So this is the load, a load in uh, kilowatt meters per minute, multiply that number with 10, 
you get the, the load which I was biking. That was quite heavy load. That was my heart rate multiply those readings with 10. So it was heart rate was uh, close to 200, 170 or something like that. Ejection time was possible to find from the signal. When heart rate increases, the ejection time comes shorter and shorter, which is natural. Stroke volume is here. I always have to say that I do not believe this reading. There must be something wrong. I, I, I cannot believe on that. It should go smoothly here, but anyhow. And when knowing stroke volume and heart rate, we get cardiac output. Again, that number should be wrong. That is a cardiac output. It increases uh, quickly to the maximum, stays there, and after the load, it goes down back. So this indicates how many physiological parameters are easily recorded with a non-invasive method, and I say quite reliably. So this reading here is problem, but otherwise I strongly believe that these readings are correct. This is why I like impedance cardiography uh, method. Uh, with this impedance cardiography or impedance plethysmography, there are a lot of other applications as well. Uh, stress response may be studied. Uh, here is a nice study by monitoring chest fluid changes. There's been fluid in the pleural space and it is just taken, been taken off uh, with a tube, with a needle and a tube and measured the uh, impedance of the thorax and as during the aspiration of the fluid, very beautifully correlate. Uh, nice study. Peripheral circulation can be measured. I do not go to the details. Deep venous thrombosis can be studied. Detection of varicose vein, so that's Krampfader of Deutsch. Uh, you know that there's in some elderly people have a lot of problems with the veins in the legs. Can be studied with the impedance method. Uh, this is what they had, the Apollo astronauts. Uh, they had this kind of medical detector harness. This is from the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. I took myself this photograph from the vitrine. This device measured heartbeats, pulse rate, breathing and temperature during the space flight. You see that one electrode has just fallen from, the, from down there. So, so many physiological parameters was possible to measure from the astronauts who were in the moon. It had not been possible to measure with any invasive method. This is the only way how to measure them. And then the data was transmitted by radio down to the earth. This is a paradigm example of biomedical engineering, how it is possible to do this kind of studies. I like that very much. Next, I go to impedance tomography. The same slide as I did show you before. Today, I, I don't go to the details anymore. I just did show it you, to you. It is in this chapter here. And I did show this to you as well uh, a few minutes ago. I don't tell that story anymore. I did show this to you also, the sensitivity distribution of impedance cardiography. Uh, this is in interesting data from the same publication, which is highlighted here. This table shows the total contribution in percentage from each tissue type and organ to the simulated basal value of impedance and measurement sensitivity distribution. So what we can learn from here? We may learn from here that uh, most of the impedance signal basal value, not, not the deflection, the delta C, but the basal Z, comes from the skeletal muscle, from the heart muscle, and from the atria and ventricles come a very small fraction of the signal. So if here and when here happens changes, the changes come to the delta C, but I just, it came to my mind that because so much 
more than half of the signal comes from the skeletal muscle, the basic value. What then when there is blood circulation is fluctuation in the, it is not constant flow, but fluctuation in the skeletal muscle as well. Doesn't it come quite much delta Z from the skeletal muscle as well? I don't have any studies on this, but this just came to my mind. And, and th this is an interesting issue. But anyhow, what you see, very small percentage of the basic signal, which is about uh, 25 ohms in, in the, in the Kinnan-Kubitschek-4 electoral system, very small fraction of that comes from the interesting regions of the thorax. Very small fraction. This is exciting. I speak about impedance tomography, but I teach you first that what is tomography. I show you some slides. Uh, the word tomography is derived from the ancient Greek. Tomos means a slice and grapho means, of course, to write. <coughs> Here is an old traditional X-ray tomography and orthopan tomography. I come to this. So X-ray tomography, this kind of uh, uh, devices did exist in the 70s when I, I was in the, working in the hospital. What it means? It means that with this device it is uh, taken an image from a certain plane of the patient. How it is done? Here is the X-ray tube, which is feeding or sending X-ray radiation through the patient, and here is the film. Just observe that uh, from that level, that level, and that level, from all these points, the image is reflected to the same point on the film. Now, during the X-ray exposure, the X-ray tube and the film are moving like this. And now you see that from that location, the image comes to the same point on the film, but from that and that location, it goes to different parts or points. Which means that uh, during this kind of moving exposure, uh, the certain plane, depending on the geometry, that will give a sharp image, and from all other uh, planes of the patient body, there comes just uh, a noise to the image. So this is the traditional tomography. I cannot avoid showing this orthopan tomography, because this is an invention in Finland by Yrjö Patero, which is a similar principle, which is an X-ray uh, image from the teeth of the patient. And this has been very successful business. 95% of the production goes to export, and which cover half of the global market. Very successful. I go next to uh, another tomography instrument. This is not impedance either. I go to EMI scanner. <coughs> uh, in uh, 1970, uh, I think it was 1972, when I made a visit to England, I made a kind of survey about biomedical engineering, and I wanted to see how it is going in, in England. And I, I, I visited hospitals, universities, Ministry of uh, Commerce and, and uh, Research Institutes, and uh, was asking about the biomedical engineering. Everyone said to me that we have the EMI scanner. We have the EMI scanner. So they was very proud about the EMI scanner. So what is the EMI scanner? It was Godfrey Hansfield, who was, was working to the musical instrument uh, company uh, uh, EMI, and made for them the first transistorized uh, computer in, in UK, and started to develop the CT. Alan Cormack was uh, 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 born in South Africa and moved to USA, made some mathematical study on this, and independently they found the same principle. So the idea is that there's an X-ray tube sending X-ray through the patient, and there are detectors on the opposite side which are detecting the X-ray signal, and this whole system is rotating around the patient, and so it is uh, taking these X-ray uh, images from uh, 360 degree. And from that, it is calculated the backward projection and obtained this kind of tomographic image. So what is the, why it is EMI scanner? 
the electrical and mu musical industries so was a company which was producing music where Hans Field was working and they had uh, Beatles uh, who made a lot of money for the Emmy company because Beatles was very popular. So Emmy had a lot of money and they didn't know what to do with that amount of money and they just started to develop or helped Hounsfield to develop this X-ray uh, uh, tomographic system. That is the reason why it is called Emmy scanner. Here is some brochure, picture of the Emmy scanner brochures from, from those early times. You see from this picture that the first working instrument had so small that it was able to take uh, tomographic images only from the head of the patient, not from the total body. In 1979, these two fellows, Gordon uh, Hounsfield and Alan Cormack, obtained uh, or received the Nobel Prize in the Physiology of Medicine from their invention. So that's how the CT scanner looks now, and these are the images made by the CT scanner. That was the introduction to the impedance tomography. In Sheffield, there was Professor Brian Brown, University of Sheffield, interested in impedance tomography. He, uh, with uh, Barber and Segar, developed this kind of algorithm for taking image, tomographic image, from the impedance of the body. They had 16 electrodes, fed electric current between electrodes, and measured voltage between the other pairs of electrodes. And they were reasoning that uh, here are the isopotential, well, here is the electric current flowing, these green lines show, and these gray lines show isopotential surfaces in the volume conductor. And they claimed or assumed that when measuring impedance with this current feeding and this voltage measuring, it gives an indication or measurement of the impedance from this region between the corresponding isopotential surfaces and only from there. That was their conclusion. When I wrote this book, Bioelectromagnetism, I did, hadn't done myself uh, research on impedance tomography. I made impedance cardiography. A uh, lot of studies, but not with impedance tomography. So I took the material from other sources, which I, of course, honestly re re refer. I draw these illustrations myself, and I didn't think that too much. I also believe that, yes, perhaps that's the case. Uh, in 2005, David Holder published uh, Electrical Impedance Tomography book, and uh, in this book, he's a famous. A colleague in uh, bioimpedance. Uh, in this book, in several pages, he also reproduced this principle. I met David Holder in Gainesville in the 2010 in the bioimpedance conference, and I discussed with him. And he wasn't was not aware about the problem, which I will tell you about this this principle. And and he was very embarrassed. Here is a few years old. Uh, I took that 2006 from internet, this uh, uh, capture of this page. It is from the Electrical Impedance Tomography Community page, uh, where they have as, as a logo for their uh, community, this image showing just that region, and it says that this website is aimed at encouraging community communication between members of the community. And they say that uh, I read it. The circular logo at the top of each page represents a circular conductive object with 16 electrodes equally spaced around the edge. If an electric current is applied between adjacent electrodes and resulting voltage measured on other pairs, it can be assumed that the measurement is sensitive to impedance changes in the brown wedge. This is prin the principle behind one of the most successful EIT systems. So that was the understanding at that time. Here is a new version of that uh, web page, which uh, was uh, published 2011. I did take this image uh, just in May this year. There's still this logo 
And there's uh, one picture from my book, as you find. I did it, they didn't ask for permission, but they placed it here. And the background of the page is, of course, the same, the same image there and several other images. So they still live with that principle. Here is a Göttingen EIT group, which have the same uh, image in their logo. In their present uh, tomography images, they, they do that apparently different way because they get better images. But what is the way? So I'm just saying that there's something wrong in the, that uh, uh, the principle shown in the previous slides. And, and what is wrong? So the idea is that they claim that this is the region from where the signal comes. But with the principle of reciprocity, if we swap the current and voltage measurements in this way, it should give the same result. But you see that, of course, it is not, it is this region when it's now in question. It is not the same, so that cannot be true. Secondly, what if we take the current measurement electrodes very close to each other, have a sensitive system here and a very small amount of noise, hopefully, then the region from where the signal should come would be very, very narrow, which would approach the accuracy of computer tomography, the X-ray. But that is not the case. So there must be something wrong. I found that there is wrong, and I told to my wife that I have found something wrong in the system, and she said that, oh, yeah, are you again the only man in the world who is right and everyone else is wrong? I said that, yes, I'm afraid that is the case. We, here, well, I show here is uh, the Draker instrument, which has images showing the same principle, but in my understanding, Draeger is doing the uh, tomographic image calculation correctly, but they show these kind of images just to, to, to uh, indicate how it could be understood. But unfortunately, these are wrong. And my, my point is that uh, showing these kind of images, uh, which are based on the old belief about the impedance image formation, decrease the reliability of the system, even though the calculation of the image is made in correct way. So that's that kind of problem. So with Pasi Kauppinen, we calculated how these impedance measurement sensitivities do show, show out. And it is published in the International Journal of Bioelectromagnetism in 2006. And here are shown those, uh, well, I can show the publication here. It, you can find it from the, from the web. It is a, a free publication on the web. I show these images just with the, uh, here. So there are different uh, algorithms for, for finding the, the impedance tomography image. Uh, the basic is the neighboring method, which I already did show you. Uh, feeding current here, measuring voltage, and then proceeding with the current feeding to the next pair of electrodes and again measuring voltage. How does the measurement sensitivity look like? It does not in reality look like that. And here is the animation which I hope that it works. Usually these don't work, but uh -huh, it, it apparently it may work. That's how it looks like. It goes quite fast. I show you still images so uh, current is fed between those electrodes, voltage is measured between those electrodes, and the measurement sensitivity distribution in this case is shown here. Blue shows negative measurement sensitivity, red shows positive measurement sensitivity, and these two black lines are just only zero sensitivity lines. And we proceed. And finally, this case where they are opposite, I just take the lines away. You find that the measurement sensitivity is surprisingly homogeneously distributed in the plane, which means that 
to create an image with this kind of sensitivity is very difficult because there is no gradient. Then again coming here back, this kind of measurement sensitivity is good for making the image because the sensitive measure measurement is sensitive to smaller region. There is big gradient in the in the in the measurement sensitivity. Cross method is another uh, uh, concept. Uh, the one electrode in the current feeding is fed at a fixed position, and the other electrode is going around in the in the. Uh, around the thorax. I show the animation. Uh, this goes... That's how the measurement sensitivity behaves as a function of the measurements. Then I show opposite method current is fed to opposite electrodes and voltage measured to adjacent electrodes. Then it is rotated one step and animation shows the measurement sensitivity. I'm surprised that these are running so well. As I said, they usually do not run. That's the problem with the computers. Okay, anyhow, it goes like that. And uh, adaptive method, where it is current, uh, uh, amount of current is adjusted so that the current is flowing homogeneously through the volume conductor. And here is the animation. That's how it looks like. And then adaptive method for animation for for uh, different oops, kind of volume conductors. It is just a head head model here, which is shown. Okay, so these are details. It is possible also to combine electricity and magnetism to feed electric current and measure the magnetic field and in that way to uh, make the tomography image or other way around. Feed uh, magnetic field and measure the voltage. I have in my book this old picture from the Wu, Hua and Webster Tompkins publication that is not very representative for this business. That's old illustration. Here is some study which we made at Tampere uh, computer simulations. I do not go too much to the details, but here are some the phantom studies made in, in, in the famous group in, in Rensselaer University. And this is a slab model. So this is not three-dimensional model, it's only a slab. Having uh, <coughs> conductivity differences produced with a kind of gale uh, particles here. And that is an image what is obtained. Here is the same thing. So this is a electric impedance tomography image from the slab, which it is not more accurate than that one. Here is uh, an Oxford Brookes University system having several levels for these electrodes. And here is from Rensselaer Laboratory, a three-dimensional image uh, measured. And here are the images on different levels. So please note that if the electrodes are on one level on the thorax, it is not the slab which is measured. It is measuring the impedance three-dimensionally, of course. And there are regions here where the sensitivity is zero because the leads are in normal. Here is a computer tomography. I compare it with the electrical impedance tomography. You see that, the, as I did show, there is an X-ray generator feeding X-ray through the body. And if the detector is very small, it is measuring the X-ray uh, uh, radiation from a very, very narrow, thin line. That is measuring that on the next line and next line. The thinner the line is, the more accurate image it is possible to reconstruct from these X-ray recordings. And this system is rotating around the patient. And from that data, the computer calculates the image. And here is an example, excellent, accurate uh, tomographical image produced with this method. And the accuracy comes from the fact, as I said, that each recording with these detectors is from 
only very narrow, thin path of the X-ray. That gives the accuracy. In impedance tomography, the basic fundamental problem is that when feeding current, the current distributes throughout the whole thorax or, 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 the, or the body uh, slab or the plane. And when measuring voltage, the voltage lead field is throughout the whole body. Therefore, each measurement includes information throughout from the volume conductor everywhere with a sensitivity which is in this case when these are opposite uh, is rather homogeneous if they are adjacent electrodes then the information is coming from the smaller region and it is uh, easier or possible to create an image and so this is rotating around and uh, the image what is obtained is typically has this kind of accuracy just for the reason which I said and you find what is the difference in in image accuracy between uh, computer x-ray tomography and impedance tomography just for that reason but computer tomography is very expensive impedance tomography is cheap Then there are some chapters uh, just at the end of the book which are not so very important issues in bioelectromagnetism but I, I just want to be uh, uh, perfected, per have a perfection and show various regions which I know that belong to bioelectromagnetism. Let's take an example from electrodermal response. Uh, here is a physiology of the, or uh, actually anatomy of the skin. That's how your skin looks like when taking a piece of, of the skin and magnified. Here are the hairs of the skin and the surface region is epidermis, then there's a dermis region and hypodermis is the deepest. Here are the arteries and veins and here are the, the nerve cells which for feeling the sensation, the touch and here are sweat glands which just uh, extract sweat to the skin. There are several different kind of uh, measurements uh, in, uh, in, in, in this uh, skin response. Here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different uh, methods. Uh, they don't necessarily differ too much from each other, but they have different names. I do not go to the details. Uh, here is one classical study, Venables and Christie. Uh, I don't go too much to the details either here, measuring the, the, the skin impedance. Skin conductor response and skin potential response readings. I don't see too much differences with these readings, so I don't go too much to the uh, details. Foles and colleagues have made an electric model for the electrodermal system. Here is a corneum, epidermis and dermis regions and re represented with different kind of resistors and, and voltage sources. And uh, here is one application of this skin, uh, galvanic skin response. It is fed uh, electric pulses between these electrodes and measured voltage and it is obtained that kind of reading. And when it is given an emotional stimulus to the patient, said something very, very uh, exciting. Uh, the patient, patient reacts with his body and uh, emotional st due to the emotional stimulus, you find that there is a, the skin response is changing. So that is a uh, electrodermal response which can be measured. Uh, these uh, phenomena have been used in different kind of psychophysiological experiments and one application is a lie detector. I think you know that the United States, it is still very much used. It has been used quite much. The, 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 the pioneer was uh, psychologist William Marston, who recorded blood pressure, pulse, respiration and perspiration. Another pioneer was John Larson, measured practically the same 
parameters called the skin conductance. This is a bioelectric measurement here. Here is a light detector. I took that from the internet. I'm sure this is from the United States. I wouldn't like to be in the position of this guy who is here tested with this light detector because personally I do not believe too much to these systems. This is surprising, very surprising. This is from from an uh, 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 afternoon newspaper in Finland, Iltalehti in 2001, uh, story about light detector. Here's a, a, a famous detective inspector, I, I believe on him, but it is said that, uh, claimed that he said that it works, I have tried it to myself, he says. But what you see here, do you see any electrodermal skin response? I feel that that's kind of F F FTB system it is feeding. Uh, file from one side to another one. It, that's not no skin, no skin response here. So this is something very very uh, unscientific issues. So let's go next next topic. Other bioelectric phenomena: electric signals originating in the eye. That that is serious. That is serious stuff. Uh, that's how eye looks like. There's a lens, but all the regions the regions in front of the lens and the main part of the eye, uh, the vitreous humor liquid, all those form uh, uh, optic system. Image is reflected to the uh, fovea, which is the region of the uh, sharp image seeing, and here is the uh, region where the optic nerve goes to the brain, which is a blind spot. Have you tried ever this this uh, experiment when there is a about 20 centimeters distance there is a five centimeters distance one cross and ball and looking at it only with with, with the right eye then you suddenly after a time you don't see the ball at all the reason is that it is reflected to the blind spot of the eye electrooculogram is an important measurement. The eye is polarized. Its anterior region is positive and posterior region is negative. If it is measured signal from these locations on the sides of the eyes and eye is turned 30 degrees to the right, it is recorded this kind of signal, uh, 150 microvolts. And if the eye is turned to the left, it is measured negative signal, in this case half of the amplitude, because it is only 15 uh, degrees. So this is an important detection of the movement of the eye. This is important. Here it is shown how the electrooculogram is measured with electrodes here around the eye. And EEG is also measured with electrodes from this lady. On the other hand, Please note that if EEG is measured on the forehead here, it may include some unwanted signals which actually originate from the eye as an electrooculogram. The eye movement is interesting. When quickly moving the uh, target of the sight to the different orientation, the uh, eye moves first close to the desired angle and then makes a small movement to go exactly to the correct orientation. So this kind of control system in the movement of eye, that is quite the same. If you happen to go to a, have, have, happen to have been in, in a big uh, industrial uh, factory where it's a very heavy elevator, you may recognize that the elevator is, when it is moving, it's moving faster, close to the level where it goes, and then the rest of the movement, it goes very slowly, just to be able to stop to the correct level. Just the same control system like in the eye movement. It's possible to measure two kinds of movements of the eye, which are vestibular nystagmus and optokinetic nystagmus. Nystagmus is, is the small vibration of the, uh, of the eye. Eyes are never just uh, fixed. Uh, they are all the time they are moving a little bit. Vestibular nystagmus looks something like this. It is connected to the balance organ system, which I did teach you earlier. And uh, optokinetic nystagmus 
in my eyes they look very much the same. I don't see really differences, but they are two different signals. That means that when you're sitting, for instance, in the train and looking looking the landscape, your eyes are moving uh, in the direction of the landscape, and then they're coming back in this way. So that, that is optokinetic nystagmus. It can be studied with a rotating cylinder, which has some stripes in front of the patient. So these, why these are measured? These are measured for making studies of, of, of the uh, physiological system uh, of the patient in the balance organ. Electroretinogram is an important measurement. It is important measurement. This is, uh, shows the retinal cellular structure of the eye. So on the retina is uh, magnified this small region. Uh, in the retina there are pigment epithelium on the back, then are the light sensitive uh, cells, rod and cones, layer of horizontal cells, bipolar cell, amacrine cell and ganglion cell. And light is coming from there on the right. Here is something which I'm surprised that why it is not so and not other way around because uh, these layers of cells just uh, uh, don't uh, let the light come directly to the rods and cones. But here is a small answer in the next slide. So rods are very light sensitive cells. They, uh, the vision under low light conditions is made by rods. They are quite slow responding to light. They have only one type of photosensitive pigment and achromatic vision. So you know by, from experience that when a very uh, dark night where you see hardly anything, you don't see any colors, you see just black and white images. Cones are not very light sensitive, so it is needed a lot of light to be able to, to stimulate the cones. Uh, with, they're used with high light conditions. They have fast response to light. There are three types of photosensitive pigment and they are used for color vision. Some photographs of pictures of, of rods and cones. And it is possible to record the response uh, when is light impulse is fed to the eye, it is possible from just with the electrode placed on, on, the, on the corner just in front of the eye to measure this kind of signal. The early receptor potential comes from the rods and cones and a one and two waves and then come oscillating potentials from these cell layers. This is electroretinogram which is an important uh, signal for studying the function of the eye. This is smart. Again, I, I used to like to say that there are a lot of smart design in the human body and in the nature. It is smart to have these layers of cells here because it means that it is a distributed computer in the visual system. The visual image is already pre-processed on the retina. Uh, different kind of issues, some contrast and, and contours and so on, which, whichever are already processed in the in the retina before the visual image is fed uh, along the, uh, the nerves to the, to the visual center of the eye or the, or the brain. So this is a solution for the question which I made. I think this is not just correctly drawn, it should be wider. The fovea is the region uh, which has the most accurate vision just in your visual field. It is directly aligned with the center of the pupil. Ganglion and bipolar cells moved aside to form this identification and allow light its only unblocked path to photoreceptor cells. So in the fovea, which is the region of the accurate vision, the other layers of the cells in the retina do not exist, they are on the side, and light can directly go to the uh, rods and cones, which makes the vision accurate in the center of the visual field. That is the trick. Uh, the optic nerve has a strange structure. Uh, from one side of the retina, optic nerves go here, and the other side of the retina, optic nerves go to the other side of the brain. And from the other eye, similarly, they go like this, 
and like this. So there's a crossing called optic chiasma, which is beautiful picture by Len uh, Nielsen taken here in the photograph. So it, it has very strange structure. Why it is so? Uh, possibly it is kind of kind of, kind of uh, way to ensure that the vision uh, stays continuously, even though part of the visual system is is destroyed. Uh, for the source of electroretinogram, there have been made some models about the about the conductivities and uh, of, of the volume conductor to make the measurements. Uh, about the color vision, some words. There was made a kind of theory by Helmholtz and Young. Thomas Young did live 100 years earlier than Hermann von Helmholtz, but it is called Helmholtz-Young theory of color vision. And the theory is that there are three kind of, uh, of uh, cones and uh, which detect uh, different kind of uh, color. And uh, this information, when it is fed to the brain, gives the possibility to see all the spectra of the colors. This is just the same principle as is on the computer screen or, or photographic film. Uh, the three different colors which are uh, recorded and then combined there with different intensities to get the whole spectrum. So it was uh, Ragnar Granit, the Finnish uh, uh, physiologist who in his uh, MD thesis made experimental work to study do these three type of cones exist and he proved this Helmholtz young theory to be correct and from this work he received the Nobel Prize. Well he made a lot of other studies as well but it was nominated to this study in he got it 1967 with Haldan Hartland and George Wald. Uh, then I show just as a, a final example of bioelectric signals I show you this. What is this? There's a nice nice uh, study or nice, nice uh, work in in, in Helsinki Water Services, uh, monitoring the quality of drinking water, the drinking water, what, what is uh, uh, fed to the water pipe system of uh, resource system of the city of Helsinki, it is uh, so water is fed through this kind of aquarium. There's a rainbow trout, and the rainbow trouts they uh, clean the, the, the gills, the, the breathing, breathing gills uh, regularly by coughing. And the, the cleaner the water is, the, the more seldom they are coughing. If it is uh, very uh, dirty, then they have to clean it more often and they are coughing uh, more frequently. And that bioelectric signal is measured in this aquarium and it's an indication of the quality of the, of the water. That's an application. This is the final picture, the electric era. The message of the 19th century ad for electric belts was clear. Customers can throw away their medicine bottles in the new era of electrical healing. So that shows the power of bioelectricity, if you believe. This is something which I didn't take here, therefore, that I came to Aachen. This has been on my lectures long time. It's a company's German Electric Belt Agency, Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn. But anyhow, that's kind of, kind of entertainment, but anyhow. Uh, I have a couple of minutes, I go back to the first slides. I hope that after following this course, lecturing course, you hopefully now understand better this, what I did teach you on the first lecture. I show you this again. I did tell you that bioelectromagnetism is divided by bioelectricity, biomagnetism and uh, uh, bioelectromagnetism and a poor magnetism. When there is activity in the uh, uh, tissue, nerve or muscle tissue, it generates, generates electric fields which can be measured, which is bioelectricity. The electric current induces a magnetic field which can be measured as a uh, biomagnetic signal. Or there may be poor magnetic material and that material in the field can be measured. I didn't discuss that too much. On the other hand, it is possible to stimulate the 
uh, nerve or muscle tissue by feeding electric current uh, to the tissue, which is electric stimulation or electric therapy. It's possible to do the stimulation also with feeding a magnetic impulse, which induces electric current, or magnetize the uh, ferromagnetic material. And the third issue, it is possible to measure the intrinsic properties of the tissue by feeding electric current to the body with so low intensity that it does not make the stimulation, but to measure the attenuation of the signal, which gives indication of the electric impedance. And in the same way as I just did teach you with the electromagnetic method to possibly measure the impedance or poor magnetic susceptibility. And I did teach you that they are the Maxwell's equations which tie together these three by three uh, subdivisions in the horizontal direction. And it is the principle of reciprocity introduced by Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz, which ties together in vertical direction. And therefore, finally, all these subfields, three by three subfields of bioelectromagnetism, are closely, tightly connected together with these two principles. And therefore, the, vis the discipline of bioelectromagnetism is a very solid discipline. This I did teach you on the first lecture, and I hope that you are now able to understand it clearly, because that is the message of all this st stuff which I have been teaching to you. And those are the examples, ECG, defibrillation, impedance measurement, and the same issues magnetically. I did show you also this illustration, which is the same map of the territory of bioelectromagnetism, shown with now equations and with the, with, with the source uh, and, and lead fields. Here's the bioelectric field from the bioelectric source measured with the lead and uh, the sources give uh, signal to the lead that is the equation and here it is fed electric current to this to stimulate the tissue and i did show you that the distribution of the electric current here is exactly the same as the distribution of measurement sensitivity in the measurement of the bioelectric signals due to the principle of reciprocity, which is a strong issue in this course, and the same in the magnetic sense also. And now look this equation for the signal of bioelectric field. When we go down to see the measurement of electric impedance, this is the equation for electric impedance. The equation for measuring the electric field is exactly the same. And this is the new aspect in this theory, showing, demonstrating how all these regions are tightly connected together. Understanding this principle gives you the possibility to govern all the bioelectromagnetic problems and understand how they are connected together. That is my message. I have uh, only a couple of minutes. I don't go in repeating further on uh, because uh, it should take, take more time. If I had a few more lectures, I had liked to do that. But uh, now it's time to thank you. And it is the end of the course. But before you go away, I just... Uh, I'm used to give some chocolate to my students after I have given a lecture, just therefore that I have so much enjoyed being with you. And here I just will open these chocolates and please, please help yourself. I just, let me see if I, this is always a bit more difficult. The most difficult part of the course is to get the chocolate open. <laughs> so, that is the end of the course. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank.